the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Oregon State Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 291 regarding a murder. Be on the lookout for Al Foster, height 60, weighs about 190 pounds. Good morning, connection with the murder of a night march at Salem. That's all. We chose the drivers of police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other emergency equipment as the first to test the radically new crash gasoline. Rio Grande did this because the pilots of these public serving cars cover more miles in a week than the average driver does in a year. They drive the most in all kinds of traffic and weather conditions. They demand of us the utmost of the motor fuel they use, both from the standpoint of performance and the wise use of the taxpayers' money. And so after the drivers of these emergency cars reported that this new all-purpose Rio Grande crash actually amazed them by its superior performance in every crisis and by its money-saving mileage as well, we knew what the verdict would be when the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood began filling your tank with this gasoline of outstanding performance. This entirely new gasoline does everything better than ordinary gasoline because twice as many vital ingredients as the three found in most ordinary fuels are so expertly combined as to make this gasoline of maximum performance and minimum cost. Get your tank full of all-purpose Rio Grande crackers in the morning. It will give you an entirely new conception of your car's performance. Tonight our story comes from the files of the Oregon State Police, and we have therefore asked Chief of Police H.M. Niles of Portland, one of the men who helped organize the State Police, to open our program from San Francisco. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we are to hear a story that has been taken from the confidential files of one of the finest police organizations in the West the Oregon State Police. It is another example of the need of cooperation between law enforcement agencies, and it is an outstanding example of how that cooperation was forthcoming to bring a band of cold-blooded murderers to justice. It is impossible to tell you all the detailed things the police did in solving tonight's case, but the hours and weeks of tireless effort that were expended by officers helped illustrate again and most forcefully, the statement of fact you have heard so many times on this program, that crime of any sort is a losing proposition. Steady, drizzling rain falling over the countryside of northern Oregon at 2.30 on the morning of May 2nd, 1931. Entering the outskirts of a prosperous little town which lay barely over 40 miles from the city of Portland, a green Chevrolet coach flashed its way toward the main street. And the few citizens abroad at such an hour and in such weather would have found it impossible to later identify the muffled features of the three men who drove along through the murky shadows of the drenched roadway. Sure you got this job case right, Al? It sounds new to me, you know. I want to know what I'm bumping into. Just sit tight. I know what I'm doing. Well, I'm like Phil here. I never saw any part of this village before. There's the main drag up ahead. What do we do after we get there? Listen, your mugs, will you quit sweating? I know this bird like a book. All you got to do is listen when I tell you. Okay, okay. We just want you to give us a dough, that's all. Right, Chuck? Yeah. All right, then. Pipe down and listen. I'm going to pull up in front of Carter's pool hall. That's right in the dead center of town. Okay, then what? Our first job is to get the night marshal out of the way. He'll be nosing around somewhere. When he sees us parked by the pool hole, he's a cinch to come over to the car to see what's going on. Yeah, that's just well in it. And then he'll wind up by throwing us in the can. He'll wind up by doing nothing. When he gets to the car, I sock him with a wrench or something, see? Then we tie him up and put the gag on him and carry him into the pool hole. Easy as that, huh? Sure. 
You guys got to remember, I figure these things out. Yeah, but suppose he don't act peaceful about getting socked over the head and that sort of squawk. The way I'll handle it, the night marshal will be tucked away in the back of Carter's before you know what's happened. I don't get it. Why go to all that trouble, Al? Why don't we duck around back and Jimmy our way in? This ain't the first save I've cracked by a long shot. But I ain't used to going around all time, folks, before I get to work. Listen, you rummies. The night marshal carries the keys to most of the stores in town. Once we got him where we know he'll keep, we open the safe in the pool hall. Then we go on to tackle the one in the post office. We get it? Yeah, that's right. With him either way, we can work all night if we have to. And nobody to bother us. Now you guys are beginning to learn. Chuck, you pass that rifle over to Phil in the back seat there. Oh, okay. You want me to keep it handy just in case, huh? Yeah, but don't start shooting up the town. An old geezer like the night marshal is going to handle easy. I got you, Al. Now look, that building on the corner there is a post office. That'll be our second job tonight. Carter's pool hole is down at the end of the next block. Right. You don't suppose anybody's liable to spot this hot car, do you, Al? What's eating you, Chuck? A guy think this was your first job. You swiped this car yourself in Salem less than two hours ago. Who'd think to look for it in a little burg like this? Sure, Chuck. I'll bet the owner hasn't missed it yet himself. Okay, boys, here's the pool hole. I'm going to pull up right in front of it. Hey, Al. Pipe the guy standing down the street there. I think he's watching us. Yeah. Say, that's luck. It's all hands on himself. And the night marshal, you mean? Yeah. You two birds keep out of sight as much as you can, see? Why don't you keep the headlights on bright, Al? And we won't be able to see who's in here until he gets right up to the car. Yeah, you're not so dumb after all. Okay, Chuck. You hand me that big wrench laying on the floor near your feet. Oh, is this one? Yeah, give it to me. Okay, but if you hit him too hard with that thing, it'll kill him sure. You let me worry about that. They sit tight. I'm going to get out and put on an act. Well, that isn't my fault, honey. Just something wrong with the engine, that's all. I'll have another look, but I don't think it'll do any good. And that's... I don't know what's the matter with this thing. I'm going to see if I can find a garage in this bird with a mechanic who knows something about engines. I won't be gone but a few minutes, dear. Uh, what's the matter, buddy? Car trouble? Yeah, yeah. Don't know what's wrong with the blame thing. Trying to find a mechanic to fix it. You know if, hey, if there's any garages open. No, well, young fella, I'm afraid you're out of luck. Nothing open here at this hour. See, that's a bad break. Kind of puts me on the spot. Uh, uh, how'd you mean? Well, you see, I got my girlfriend with me in the car, and the well, folks are going to raise cane about me getting her home so late. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, a girl's parents are a little touchy when their daughter's kept out late. But then you can't help what you can't help. Yeah, but don't you see her? The old man will be waking up with murder in his eyes. I just got to get her home. Well, it seems to me that you got her out pretty late as it is. Oh, this isn't the first time this evening the old bus has broken down. Had trouble with it all night. Otherwise, I'd have had her home hours ago. Uh-huh. Well, I'll see what I can do. But mind, I'm not much of a mechanic. Now, that's swell of you, mister. Thanks. Uh, I don't expect too much. I've got a car of my own that acts up once in a while, so I can fix the little things, but if it's anything complicated, there won't be much I can do. It'd sure help me out if you can get it started. Well, now there's no need for you to worry. If it's anything that can't be fixed, I'll be only too glad to talk with the girl's parents on the telephone and explain the situation. That's darn nice of you, mister. Yeah, nasty kind of a night for a fellow and his girl to be caught out in. Yeah, but by the way... Is that wrench you're carrying the only one you got? Yeah. Why? Uh, looks to me like it's too big to be of much use in a case like this. Well, here we are. You might as well turn off those headlights. Oh, no help. I have a flashlight here. All right. Get the hood up and we'll see what we can find out. But I'm blamed if I can see how I can use a wrench as big as that one. Okay, mister. Then I'll show you how I can use it. Here, what you trying to do? Oh, it's going to be difficult, eh? Look out, Al. He's reaching for his gun. Uh, get your hands up, you dirty little puppy. No! God, Phil, you shot the old man. Of course I shot him. Come on, Al. Get in here quick. Start it up, Chuck. Yeah, Paul, what you threw him for? I could have hit him again with a wrench before he got his gun out. Uh, those shots in that busted window wake up the town. Uh, Coffin is getting in. we got to scram out of here. Yeah, I'll say we do. You've let us in for a murder rap, Phil. That bullet caught him square between the eyes. Where to? Head for the Columbia over the highway. I'll tell you what I'm... The abandoned murder car, which had been reported stolen from a driveway in Salem, was discovered in Bootlegger's Canyon near the Dalles, Oregon. 
The trail of the tires checked exactly with prints left on the wet street at the scene of the killing. But beyond that, there were no other clues. The murderers of Knight Marshal Hanson had vanished completely. Since no robbery had been attempted, the police were in doubt as to the motive for the shooting. Months went by as the trail grew colder and colder. And then one day, Sergeant Frank Douglas, who in company with Deputy Sheriff Sam Carlson, was in charge of the case, appeared at the office of Mayor Jackson. Well, Mayor Jackson, I've finally found a fellow who knows something about that Hanson case. Oh, you have, Sergeant? Fine. Where is the man? Deputy Sheriff Carlson's in the outer office with him now. All right. Have them come right in. Okay, Sam. Bring him in. Come on, Frederick. This is Harry Fredericks, Your Honor. Oh, now, you claim to know something about the killing of Knight Marshal Hanson, do you? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Only, only don't go spreading it around. I told you this, see? Now, any evidence you have to offer will be held in strict confidence, Mr. Fredericks. Uh, okay, then. Well, uh, there's a guy in the county jail named Peter Reynolds. Maybe you heard of him? Oh, I'll say we have. I arrest him. He's doing time on a license for his charge. Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. Well, Pete told me he knows a guy, a uh, fellow named Giles. He, he says he sold his owl a gun because the guy was figuring on blowing the safes in the pool hall in the post office. Uh, and he said that... Uh, uh, did your friend uh, mention Al's last name? Huh? Oh, no. No, he just called him Al, that's all. Oh, all right, Fredericks, go on. Yeah, well, um, Pete said this fellow Al disappeared right after the night Marshall was booked off, see? Uh-huh. And uh, then he came back a couple of months later... He told Pete that uh, him and two other guys pulled the killing that night. Uh, do you know where Al is now? No, not at all. Uh, Pete said the guy beat it again. But he's a good friend of Pete's. Maybe Pete can tell you more about that than I can. Yeah, maybe he can. Uh, while you get this man's signed statement, Your Honor, Sam Carlson and I are going to drive over to the county jail at Salem. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll have something more to report when we get back. <laughs> to nobody. I don't know nothing about it. No? Then where did Al get the gun? How in places should I know? He gave you $3 for the gun, didn't he? No, he gave me... I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, sure you do, Pete. Where's Al now? I don't know. Come on, where's he hiding now? I don't know, I tell you. You can't make me talk. You can't never make me talk. We'll be back later, Pete. <laughs> Sergeant Douglas wasted no time in making a careful checkup of the activities of Peter Reynolds. Investigation proved that Reynolds was suspected of heading a local gang of hoodlums thought to be responsible for a number of house robberies, and brought to light the information that a member of this gang, Al Foster, had disappeared from the vicinity several months earlier. Thus, the investigation swung to the activities of Al Foster, and several mornings later found Sergeant Douglas and Deputy Sheriff Sam Carlson driving toward a home in the residential section of Salem. Oh, this is the kind of a job I hate, Sam. Having to ask a boy's mother to help us locate her own son so we can arrest him on a murder charge. Yeah, it is tough. Do you suppose Mrs. Foster will be willing to cooperate with us, Sergeant? I don't know. Parents generally do one of two things. They either work with you to the limit or hold out on you altogether. You said Al's mother was a maid or something in one of the houses out here, didn't you? Yeah, the poor woman's worked like a slave for years to give that boy an education and try to make a man out of him. Yeah, it must be pretty tough on her when he had to do that stretch in the pen last year. I suppose it was. Well, there's the house. Let's pull up and get this over with. I don't know about you, but to me, this is just like pulling eye teeth, Sam. No, it can't be helped. We have to do it often enough. Where's the bell? Here's the knocker. We'll use that. I'm looking for a Mrs. Foster. Does she live here? Yes, I'm Mrs. Foster. What is it you want to see me about? I've come to discuss some matters with you concerning your son. Alfred? Yes, Mrs. Foster. Oh, are you the lawyer who's going to take Al's case? Huh? Step inside, won't you? Oh, thank you. You uh, speak of a lawyer. Is your son in some kind of trouble right now? Oh, then you're you're not... A lawyer? No, Mrs. Foster, I'm not. But you said you came here to see me about Alfred. My son wrote me that he needed a lawyer, but didn't have the money to get one. He was hoping that one of his friends here would... Would what? Well, if you're not a lawyer, then who are you? I'm Sergeant Douglas of the Oregon State Police. Oh. This is Deputy Sheriff Carlson. How do you do? Police, but... but what do you want with my son? That's what we came here to see you about. Just where is your son right now, Mrs. Poster? Why, he's... 
I don't know where he is. Oh, I don't understand how you feel, but I wish you'd try to be frank with us. Well, but what's he done? Why are you looking for him? I have reason to believe your son has involved himself in a pretty serious mess, Miss Forster. I want to ask him some questions. You mean you think he's gotten in trouble here? I'm sure he has. Well, but, but that's impossible. Impossible? Why? You told me yourself that Alfred was in trouble. Uh, yes, but in, in another state. So you see, he, he couldn't be in any trouble around here. I can prove it. Well, I hope you can, Mrs. Forster. I sincerely hope so. But how? Because Al's been in jail up in Washington for the last two months. In Washington? Where in Washington? Well, I, I'd rather not tell you that. <laughs> we have ways of finding out, you know. Well, just the same, I... I just can't. All right, never mind, Mrs. Forster. <laughs> I understand how unpleasant all this must be for you. But there's one more question I'd like to ask. Yes? You know the name of the friend your son expected to get a lawyer for him? Yes, it was Peter Reynolds. I see. And you say Alfred's been in jail somewhere in the state of Washington for the last two months? Yes. But you see, he, he couldn't possibly have gotten into trouble down here. I'm sorry, Mrs. Forster, but I think it's only fair to tell you that your son is suspected of being involved in... In a murder oh. that took place near here over seven months ago. Oh, my poor boy. Sergeant Douglas systematically went about telephoning the sheriffs of every county in the state of Washington until at last his efforts were rewarded by getting a line on the fugitive from the sheriff's office at Everett. Here he learned that Alfred Foster had been sentenced to the Washington State Reformatory at Monroe to start serving a sentence of from one to ten years for second-degree larceny. Immediately, Douglas set out for Monroe by automobile, and the following afternoon was closeted with the prisoner. So far, so good, Al. You've accounted for your movements during the year pretty well up to the month of May. Now, where were you and what were you doing last May? I've already told you I was in Idaho all during April and May. Yeah, yeah, but you haven't told me yet what you were doing. Uh, just one thing and another. Fighting forest fires, mostly, I guess. Fighting forest fires? In April and May? Sure. Why not, copper? Because there weren't any forest fires in Idaho in April or May. Why don't you try telling the truth for a change, Al? You'll get along a lot better. Listen, I don't know what this is all about or why you're here, but get this. You ain't got nothing on me, so you might just as well can a chatter and run along. Then why did you tell me you were in Idaho during April? I can produce witnesses willing to swear that you worked for a hop grower near Salem, Oregon most of that month. Oh, yeah? Yeah. In fact, here's a paycheck you cashed at a store in Hopmere on April 29th. Where'd you get that? That's beside the point. Now, let's get down to cases. Why'd you kill Bill Hanson the night marshal down in Oregon? Kill the... Hey, listen. What makes you think that I... Come on, spill it. Why'd you murder him? Why... Hey, look, copper, you, you got this all wrong. Come on, Al, out with it. Well, if you think I kill him, you're crazy. It was one of the other guys. But you were with him? Yeah, yeah, I was with him, all right, but, but give me a chance to talk, will you? Yeah, that's what I'm here for, to listen to you talk. Now, talk. Listen, if I tell you everything, can you make it easier for me? I'm not promising a thing. As far as I'm concerned, you'll get what you deserve. The works. Yeah, but I didn't do it. It wasn't me that shot Hanson. All right, who was it, then? Why don't you come clean with me? Look. Here's what happened. I picked up two guys in the card room at Portland. I don't know who they were. One of their first names. One of them was an old hand at safe cracking. I figured I could use him. What for? To open the safes in Carter's pool hall in the post office back there where old Hanson was killed. The other guy just happened to be around. I cut him in. Three of us went to Salem and swiped the car. Wait a minute. <laughs> Although Alfred Foster made a full confession of his part in the crime, he lied in naming his two accomplices, as Sergeant Douglas soon learned. In a second drilling at the Monroe Reformatory, Al Foster named two other men as his companions, but subsequent investigations proved that he had lied again. And so for a third time, Sergeant Douglas was forced to confront the youthful bandit. You've lied to me twice now, Foster. This is your last chance to come clean. You'll either tell the truth or you'll go up alone to pay for the murder of Knight Marshal Hanson. I haven't meant to lie to you, Sergeant. I, I just couldn't help it. What do you mean you couldn't help it? I'm afraid of Phil. He's a killer. Phil? Phil who? Who's he? What do you know about him? He's the guy who fired the rifle. I don't know his name. Honest. I heard Chuck call him Phil. 
It's all I know about him, except that he was a guy who was going to blow the safes. What about this fellow Chuck you've mentioned? Who's he? Chuck? His name's Fielding. Chuck Fielding. He's a sailor. Merchant Marine, U.S. Navy, or what? Merchant Marine. He's an A.B., able-bodied seaman. Told me his ship's out of Portland when he can get a berth. I met him first. In this card room you were telling me about? Yeah. He was broke, looking for some easy dough. So I tipped him to the job I had in mind. He dug up this guy, Phil, somewhere. And you know the rest. Tell me this, Al. Why didn't you work with your own mob in Salem? None of them guys knew how to blow a safe. Besides, I'd have had to cut the tape too many ways. I was out after important dough. You're telling the truth this time, Foster? Honest to God, I am, Sergeant. All right, but God help you if you've lied to me again. Sergeant Douglas of the Oregon State Police. What can I do for you, sir? I've just come over from the Seamen's Union. There's a sailor that I'm trying to pick up for questioning. The Union people knew who he was, all right, and referred me to your company. What's the Seaman's name, Sergeant? Charles Fielding. He's an A.B., I believe. Just a moment. I'll check on that for you. Hello, Tad. Say, have we got a Seaman by the name of Charles Fielding listed on any of our ships? Yeah, that's the name. Check on it and call me back right away, will you please? Thanks. Is there a definite charge against this man, Sergeant? I'll say there is. Murder in the first degree. Murder, huh? That's right. Well, if the man you want is aboard one of our ships, you still may find matters a little complicated. In what way? Well, for instance, we uh, we can radio the captain to arrest the seaman if you want us to, but if we do this according to maritime law, he'll have to be taken off ship at the first American port of call. That might be anywhere from San Francisco to New York. I see. And if he isn't put under arrest? Then... Well, then he might jump ship anywhere along the line and simply disappear. Mm-hmm. That's not so good. Well, I drove all night from Monroe, Washington, to Portland here in hopes that I might... Pardon me, my side. Yes? Oh, yes, Ted. He is. I see. Thanks. Well, the man you want is signed aboard one of our ships, all right, Sergeant. Good. That's a break. Yeah, I wonder. Did I hear you say you drove all night to get here this morning? Yes, why? Where were you about midnight? Midnight? Oh, coming through Olympia, I believe. Well, at midnight, Sergeant, the Nevada cleared from Olympia for the Orient with Charles Fielding aboard. And the first port of call is in China. <laughs> During the course of the voyage, radio contact was kept with the Nevada. Charles Fielding remained with his ship, the officers having given him no cause to suspect that they were aware of the fact that he was a fugitive. And so less than four weeks later, when the Nevada again entered the Columbia River, Sergeant Douglas was on hand at the Portland docks to meet him. Now, hold on there a minute, young fellow. Excuse me. Yeah. Your name's Charles Fielding, isn't it? Yeah. Well, this is it, Fielding. Hey, what's this all about? What are the bracelets for? You don't mind that now. Just climb into this automobile. Well, well, where are you taking me? To headquarters. The Oregon State Police have a little matter they want to talk over with you. Hey, I don't get it. If this is a frame-up, I'm going to find You're out You're going to find out plenty in a few minutes, Fielding. Well, you're still wondering what this is all about, are you, Fielding? Yes, sir. Well, my lad, you're here because of your part in the murder of a night marshal on the morning of May 2nd, last year. Well, you got anything to say? Well, yes, I... I admit my part in it. Well, that's a good start, Fielding. I suppose you tell me all about it. Well, I'm not surprised you caught me. God knows I've been worried sick about what happened that night. It was terrible to kill, kill a poor old man like that. Yes, you're right, it was. You ever been in trouble before? Oh, never in any serious trouble. I've, oh, I've been run in once or twice for getting drunk and getting into fights and stuff like that. Mostly in foreign ports, though. But I, well, I've never been in a jam like this before. How'd you happen to get mixed up with a fellow like Al Foster? Well, we got acquainted in a card room here in Portland. He told me he was planning on blowing a couple of safes in a little town close to here. 
and said there wasn't any risk and, well, that we could get away with it easy. And you fell for it, huh? Yes, sir. I, I was broke and hungry, and, well, I, I didn't know nothing else to do. It's too bad, Fielding, because now you're under arrest for murder. Well, I guess I'm as guilty as the other two fellows, but I'm ready to take my own medicine. I'm willing to help you all I can. That's the way to talk. Now, who was the third man that night? The other man besides Al and yourself, I mean. Oh, the, the guy that shot the old man? Yeah. Well, gosh, I, I don't know, Sergeant. I, I swear that as I'm sitting here, I know he's a sailor like me, and one well, of the fellows called him Phil, but honest, that's all I know about him. Stop and think a minute, Fielding. Didn't you ever hear him say what companies he'd worked for, what ships he'd sailed on? No, he, he never talked much about himself. Well, there must be a hookup somewhere, if you can only remember. No, I can't. I can't seem to... Well, let's see. Say, did you ever see a seaman's passport? No, I can't say as I ever did. Well, look, here's mine. You see? It's just a little sheet of paper that identifies this as American seaman. We need them in foreign ports. Let's have a look at that. Mm-hmm. Complete identification with a snapshot attached. Well, what's on your mind? I, I just remembered about a year ago... Phil and I were here in Portland. And Phil was broke, so, well, he hocked his seaman's passport in the pawn shop. A pawn shop? Where? Which one? Well, I, I think it was on First Street. I don't think he ever redeemed it. Would you know the pawn shop if you saw it again? Well, I, yeah, I think so. Then come along. We're going to go and look for that passport. <laughs> the pawn shop was located and the passport recovered. With it in Sergeant Douglas' possession, developments multiplied rapidly. Photostatic copies of it were mailed throughout the country. Almost immediately, a report came in from the Texas Rangers giving complete information about the man sought by the Oregon State Police. The fugitive's real name, Hans Riker, was now known to the officers. And within a few days, word came from the Seattle Police that they had taken a sailor into custody who answered the description of the wanted man. Although the seaman had been booked under a different name from the one signed to Riker's passport, Sergeant Douglas, nevertheless, left immediately for the northern city to confront his prison. Well, Riker, I don't suppose you thought the law would ever catch up to you, did you? I don't know why you keep calling me Riker. I told you a dozen times my name's Chandler. Did you ever see this little slip of paper before? What slip of paper? This one right here. Ah. Oh, so that's why you guys keep calling me Riker, is it? That's because the bird whose mug is on here looks a little bit like me. Not only looks like you, Riker, is you. Don't hand me that, chopper. You know as well as I do how screwy these snapshots turn out most of the time. Well, if I looked like this gorilla, I'd never show my pan on the street again. Yeah, you're not far wrong with that last crack, Riker. Particularly when there's a couple of old buddies of yours back in Oregon waiting to identify you. Yeah? Well, they could be wrong, too, you know. Maybe. But whatever may be wrong with a camera or the human eye, you can't fool that little old fingerprint pad. The Texas Rangers cooked your goose a long time ago, Riker. The time when they put ink on your fingers. In just a moment, we shall present concluding facts regarding our program. Just now, I ask you to remember what I told you about the new all-purpose Rio Grande Cracked when you're ready for the next tank full of gasoline. Remember that the drivers of police cars and other public serving equipment and many thousands of individual motorists acclaim this new motor fuel of all-purpose performance for meeting every requirement, including low cost. Remember, too, that when you tank up with this completely different gasoline, you get double the number of potent ingredients found in most ordinary fuels. Get all-purpose Rio Grande Cracked the most highly recommended public-serving gasoline sold in the West. Riker and Foster were sentenced to life in prison, and Fielding received a sentence of 10 years in the Oregon State Penitentiary. There's is another example of the truth of the statement, crime cannot pay. For 
Oregon State Police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 291 regarding a murder. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Roll the evil. Narrator Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Next week at this hour, Rio Grande will present The Case of the Wire-Bound Wrists, 